So, hello and welcome to the second episode of the Staying In Podcast. I am your host, Jamie, aka Casually Explained. And today we're going to be looking at some of the stories behind the Casually Explained videos. And I thought that the uh, uh, most sensible way to do that would be to go back in time from the very beginning of the YouTube video career and do it in uh, chronological order, but also cherry picking a few of the most popular videos. And we're going to, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background and I'm going to talk about each video as we go along a little bit, um, but we're also going to be uh, taking a look at those of uh, a few ones that I've compiled. So if we go back to the start of this whole YouTube situation, and I'm sure uh, some of you are already aware of this, and if you listened to the last podcast, it, I did touch on a little bit, but the origin of the Casually Explained YouTube channel uh, was on December 7th, I believe, 2015. <clears throat> and uh, I was just about to finish my first semester of engineering. And uh, that means after you finish the first semester, that means you have to do exams. And so the classes were over and uh, I had to do some studying, obviously. And as I was studying on one of the very first nights that I was free, I had all this free time. I was thinking, God, you know what? I'm one semester in. I'm one semester in into a five year degree because you have to do a year of like internship, basically. And <clears throat> it's like, my God how am I going to get through this? How is this even possible? And I thought, you know what? And I was watching these YouTube tutorials, you know, like Patrick, whatever his name is, who does calculus tutorials. And he was like really good at explaining all these concepts. Everything he was saying made sense. And I thought to myself, you know what? I think I could do this. I think I'm good at explaining things. I could learn these concepts and explain them on YouTube. And that would motivate me to get through this next five years of engineering. And so I thought to myself, this is a great idea. So what I did is I sat down and I'm studying calculus, you know, calculus 100, math 100. I'm learning about derivatives. I'm learning about um, integration. I'm learning about all sorts of different things related to just, you know, polynomial equations and that type of thing. And I was like, you know what? I'm ready to make my first video. And so I spent probably three or four hours writing everything down, making the equations, filming it, ready for my first video. I came up with the name, Casually Explained, pretty smart. And I filmed this video, I uploaded it, and uh, this, is, this is what I came up with. So I'm going to walk you through the steps that I would use to sketch a graph of a polynomial function. Um, these might seem daunting at first because it's not always intuitive what the graph's going to look like, but what we can actually do is take each term and type them into Wolfram Alpha. Damn. So, long story short, I'm a fucking fraud, dude. It didn't work. It didn't work. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. I had no idea. I couldn't do math. I couldn't do it better than they did on YouTube. That's what I ended up doing. So I made that video and I was like, oh God, you know, I'm never going to be, I'm never going to be an engineer. <laughs> That's never going to happen. So I, uh, I made this video and I was like, oh, this is funny. Whatever. I'll post this. I posted, I don't even remember what time I posted. It was late at night, I think. And, uh, I posted it on a uh, Reddit under a subreddit called YouTube Haiku. And YouTube Haiku is for videos under 30 seconds long. So I posted it there and I went to sleep. And when I woke up, I, I actually forgot that I posted this video. And I just kind of walking around and just minding my own business. And I was like, I feel like I had something to do today, but I've forgotten. So I was getting ready to study and I was like, oh shit, yeah, I better look at that video, see how it how it how it went. And so I uh, I went on YouTube, I took a look, and the video had 200,000 views. And I was like, holy shit, what the, 200, what? 200,000 views? And so I go to YouTube Haiku and it was like, it was on the front page of YouTube Haiku, but I was like 200,000, what the hell? And uh, apparently someone took it and cross posted it to r slash videos. And I went to r slash videos and it was on the front page there as well. And I was like, oh my God, I'm on the front page of Reddit. Holy shit, holy shit. And I, I, I might have told Jimmy, I don't remember, but 
I don't think I told anyone else because I didn't want people to know that was my YouTube channel because then I was just planning all these future videos and I was like, I don't want anyone to know it's me. Like, it's too much pressure. It's too much pressure that way. But what I think the funniest thing is about that uh, situation was it wasn't till later, uh, like a few videos later when it was going a bit better that I actually told, uh, or at least my other friends found out about it. And uh, I I remember telling Sam, and that's, that's Defrep in the chat if he's here, but uh, I told Sam, and Sam was like, oh, wait, so you, you made that, you made the calculus video? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, oh yeah. I remember seeing that on Reddit and I like saw it and was like, oh, this is funny. And then I upvoted it and that was it. <laughs> and he had no idea it was me. And he's like, yeah, thinking back, yeah, it, it, it did sound like you. That makes sense. And, <laughs> and so he had no idea. I, I guess Jimmy just said in the chat, I told him. So yeah, Jimmy had an idea. And uh, so that was the big beginning. That was the big beginning. That was the first, holy shit, this, this is something. You know, I had a thousand subscribers. Pretty solid. You know, a thousand's not bad. I, I specifically chose Casually Explained as a name because it was what I thought that people would see it and be like, oh, this seems like someone who will make more videos, so I'll subscribe to him. So that was my thinking. So I made another video that was basically the same thing over again with a bit of a different sort of uh, joke, right? And then I was like, you know what? And that one did okay, and I was like, you know, I need to live up to this casually explained name. And so what I did was make a, uh, I made a slideshow in MS Paint, um, from MS Paint drawings, and it was in the style of like grade A under A sort of. I was like, oh, I want to do something like grade A under A, did like these girly drinks versus manly drinks, and his drawings were trash, but the video was really funny, so like I know that works. I, I think I could do that, so I whipped out the MS Paint. And I just was like writing this script that I just, I don't even know how I, how I came up with anything. I was just kind of like coming up with jokes and the title of the video was Absolute Hot. And it was about temperature. And uh, I guess I'll, uh, I guess I'll show it to you. Temperature, generally speaking, is a measurement of a material's average internal kinetic energy at a given moment. Essentially, particles are always jiggling around, and the faster they collectively do so, the higher the temperature. It naturally follows that if these particles were to be completely stationary, we would have a minimum temperature, or what we call absolute zero. While this point can never be achieved, as any substance being cooled will asymptotically approach the temperature of its cooling agent, what would happen if we were to continually add energy instead? At 0.01 degrees, we have the triple point of water, where it can exist as a gas, liquid, or a solid. At 20 to 25, we have typical room temperature, and then at very slightly under 100 degrees, we have the boiling point of water. Increasing this to 600 degrees, we have the temperature of a typical small wood fire, and then just a bit hotter than that, we have Natalie Dormer, or in the scientific community, 1ND, or dorm. At around 10 dorms, we have the temperature of the Earth's core, which is quite similar to the surface of the sun, and then around 24 kilodorms, we have the center of the sun. Eventually, at an absolutely insane 9 gigadorms, we have the highest measured laboratory temperature, which was achieved in 2012 at CERN laboratories where researchers used the Large Hadron Collider to reheat a frozen hot pocket. This maximum temperature is known as HPP, or the hot pocket potential, and has since become a mainstay in thermodynamic studies of high energy systems. At an incredible 180 tera HPP, we have the temperature of the universe when it was 10 to the negative 35 seconds old. Imagine all the matter in the entire universe contained in a nearly infinitesimally small space and the absolutely absurd levels of energy that were present. Finally, at 260 quintillion HPPs, or just under 142 nonillion degrees, we have the postulated absolute hot, or Planck's temperature. This is the point at which gravitational forces between particles would be as strong as other fundamental forces and proves to be a barrier to our current model of physics. Uh, there is one more temperature, which is unofficially named P plus 1, which is Planck plus 1, or a single degree above absolute hot. It's actually a field of study for me, and I coined this temperature as MNMT, which stands for Maximal Nuclear Measurement Temperature. But the acronym proved difficult to publish, so I eventually shortened it to simply my new mixtape. Wow, okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, pretty weird watching back some of those, but uh, anyway, so that was it. And, uh... I, uh, I finished this video at like 3 a.m. and uh, I was like, this is so stupid. This is me talking to myself. I was like, this is so stupid. Like I'm ending a, I'm ending a video with a mixtape joke and I'm talking about hot pockets and dorms. And I was like, 
oh my god, what am I doing? And I was like, well, I made the video. Like, I gotta... What else am I gonna do? I'll just... I guess I'll release it. So I upload it. And I publish it at, like, 3.30 in the morning. And in the description, I even wrote, like, oh, you know, when you think of a joke and think it's funny, but it's 3 in the morning or whatever. And so, you know, you're nervous about the impact of your inconsequential YouTube video career and blah, blah, blah. This really kind of, like, self-doubting YouTube description. And then I uploaded it and I went to sleep. And, uh... I woke up in the morning and it was it was fucking number one on r slash videos and i was like oh my god holy shit i'm i it's 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 not bad people don't mind it. people think it's okay and i was so happy because i was like completely doubting myself on this video i thought it was either i thought it was funny but i was like i might just make this and people think it's the stupidest thing they've ever seen and i was so lucky that it was good and uh I was like really confident then. And I was like, you know what? I got to make another one like this, you know? And I had this idea in the back of my head for a while of making a video that sort of combined uh, real life with video games. And uh, in particular, I wanted to do one on explaining evolution. And I want to explain evolution partially because, you know, this is coming, uh, coming off the back of the old era of rage comics and stuff where uh you know there's this big like you know the the r slash atheism movement like all all that type of like you know creation myth type of stuff and that was well in the past but in the back of my head i was still because i kind of came up with this idea back then and i was like you know what i'd like to do a video explaining evolution that looks like it's about to be controversial because it would have been at the time uh and then just make it about video games and i think that'd be really funny and um so coming off the back of absolute hot I had probably 30, maybe 20,000 subscribers, and I was feeling really good. And I was like, you know what? If that video worked, you know what? This video is uh, this video is also going to work. Hang on a sec. I'm just going to turn the, uh, the, the music down a little bit. And, uh, you know, this video, I think this video is also going to work. So then I made this. Evolution is the process by which hereditary traits of a species change over successive generations. Much like how no two humans are alike, every creature always has its own genetic code and therefore its own minute differences from another in its species. These tiny differences sometimes offer small survival advantages. They mean a creature may be more likely to later reproduce and pass on its genes. Every organism is essentially the result of millions of iterations of successful ancestors, which creates the tremendous diversity and optimization we see around us. To give a very basic illustration of this process, imagine a species of fish that has plenty of food, but is always being hunted by sharks. However, the environment is rich with orange coral, creating a potential refuge for the fish. Assuming biology allows it, the ones most similar in color to the coral will have a better chance of survival and passing on their genes, so over a long period of time, the species will tend to become more and more orange. On the flip side, the sharks don't need to hide from predators, so the process is a bit different. A shark's survival depends on hunting, so naturally the sharks who are better equipped to find prey will complete quests faster and gain more experience points. Once a certain threshold of XP is reached, the creature evolves to the next level and is given a few points that can be invested in different skill trees. As an example, ducks sacrifice some proficiency in swimming, flying, walking, intelligence, foraging, having hands, being able to see in front of them, and resistance <laughs> to being kicked in order to be deeply invested in skill trees like buoyancy. The most competitive animals tend to invest more heavily in just one or two skill trees, however, so creatures like eagles choose almost pure flying and hunting builds while humans are deeply specced into the intelligence tree. While hybrid or tweener builds are viable, they're typically not chosen for their lack of specialization. This is evident in animals like the platypus, which are mediocre at swimming, walking, and eyesight, yet also for some reason lay eggs, have venomous spurs, and can sense electromagnetic waves. In order to moderately invest in such a diverse skill set, platypuses neglect to have other basic features like stomachs or nipples. I'm not joking, that's actually real. Evolution is generally a very slow and gradual process, but sometimes extreme natural disasters can cause mass extinctions that often bring rise to tremendous change in relatively short periods of time. Think of events like ice ages, widespread disease, volcanic eruption, and even meteor impacts. As an example, it's believed that around 66 million years ago, a meteor impact effectively blocked out the sun with debris and made a crater 180 kilometers in diameter. This event wiped out 75% of living plant and animal species on the planet and is considered one of the Earth's most controversial balance updates. 
Finally, while evolution is one of the most comprehensive and accepted theories in science, in a recent peer-reviewed article published in Nintendo Power, it was discovered the whole process could be completely cancelled by pressing B. Checkmate! Alright. So yeah, Duck's pretty stupid. Um, at any rate, after that point, and don't worry, I'm not going to show every single video. Uh, after that point, because that video did really well too, because there's a there's a subreddit called Outside, which is basically um, making jokes about real life and comparing it to video games, and it did really well on that subreddit, and it did okay on r slash videos, and uh, overall it did, it did well, and it brought me up to like 40,000 subscribers, and I was feeling so good, because I had uh, almost all of my videos did at least well, if not very well, and I'd made four at that point, and that was in like a month, and I was like, oh my god, this is like going so well, and I'm still in school, like I just finished, went through exams, I did fine, moving on to the second semester, and I was like, this is great, I'm just going back to school, I'm gonna be working on YouTube, I'm gonna be um, working at school, and everything's gonna be great, and I'm coming off all these great videos, and I felt like everything that I made was gonna be fantastic. So I made this video called, the next one is called Casually Explain the Aging Process. And it was one of the worst videos I've ever made. It was, it was fucking trash. And no one watched it. I mean, some people did and they're like, oh, okay, another casually exposed. It's all right. And I was like, what the shit? Look, it's got like, I don't know, 15,000 views uh, compared to, you know, like 500,000 or like 800,000 of the previous ones. And I was like, oh my God, it was just luck. This whole thing was just like, this is such a disaster. What, how, like, oh, <laughs> what, what's the secret formula? Cause like, I, 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 was, I made absolute hot and I had a few jokes that I was like kind of ready to make. And then evolution, like it was an idea that I already had that I thought would be good. And so then I made this other one and it didn't go very well. And I was like, oh, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> I made four videos and I'm all out of ideas. Oh no. And so uh, that was really bad. And so I released that and I was like, oh God. And I was thinking about taking it down, but I was like, oh, I can't do that. Cause I, I hate when people like, you know, d d you know, post something and then get bad reviews and then take it off. Like it's, it's part of, it's part of the, you know, I wanted to look back at it later, hopefully. That's what I tell myself. So I left it up and I was like, oh, well, I'm sure it's not that bad. And um, <clears throat> so interestingly at that time, uh, uh, a lot of people, as I was like, you know, because I just made the channel a month ago and it already had like 40,000 subscribers or something like that. And uh, a lot of people were comparing me to another YouTube content creator named You Suck at Cooking. And You Suck at Cooking had a similar sort of satirical style, uh, except he made uh, cooking videos and only cooking videos. They were just, you know, um, seven ways to uh, chop an onion, seven, da, 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 how to make this breakfast. And uh Great description, right? And people thought we were the same person because we both made videos with our hands in it as a first person video at first. And then uh, our voices sounded similar apparently. And so uh, he sent me a few emails and he's like, hey man, it's just, it's me. And like, you know, people think we're the same person, ha 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 ha. And we had a good back and forth going and he he had something like 350,000 subscribers at the time. So he was much bigger, but, um, oh, I feel like my kitchen's falling apart. But, uh, He's like, oh, uh, interestingly, kitchen, yeah, good, good timing. But uh, we had a back and forth and he was much more popular than I was. So I felt kind of weird emailing him and I was kind of like, oh my God, a popular YouTuber is talking to me. And so uh, anyway, I was like, hey, do you want to do like a 30 second collaboration? You maybe make something and we could do it together, uh, that type of stuff. And he was like, oh, sure, I can make a 30 second little segment. I'm sure, you know, the, the quote unquote fans would like it. So uh, we did that. And um, it was an interesting resolution to it, but I'll show you the video first. Dating is the human courtship ritual whereby individuals in the species try to adequately determine a sexual partner. Although a natural- Just uh, very quickly, I, uh, <laughs> watching back at some of these old ones, I'm like, okay, yikes, but you know, a part of history, you know, you gotta, you gotta take it. process, it's something that's been pondered by the brightest minds since the beginning of time. Isaac Newton, one of the greatest mathematicians of the 17th century, yet a virgin until the day he died once proclaimed, Seducing a woman is like the cotangent function. No matter how close I get, I can never quite touch the pie. And it wouldn't be until the early 20th century that the mystery was finally solved when German theoretical physicist Werner Hedtrainer Heisenberger suggested that while success itself cannot be predicted, the optimal time of approach can be modeled with his equation known as the male attractiveness net uncertainty principle. 
which is shown here. As for the corresponding variables, A is how attractive you are on a scale of 1 to 10, B is how drunk you are on a scale of 1 to 10, C is obviously just the speed of light, and then the D is just in inches. So lastly, you want to multiply by H2O when L goes to S, which is just the freezing point of water, and you get how long you should wait before talking to the girl you like. In modern times, dating hasn't changed much. It's still two people in a neutral, inoffensive location, doing something neither person wants to do while trying to mask their own degenerating self-doubts. And for first impressions, it really doesn't matter how much the other person has right, it's how much they have wrong. You can go on a date with someone who has the perfect face, great sense of humor, plays sports, awesome personality, apple bottom jeans, boots with a fur, but there are no perfect tens. They're a Scientologist. And based on the Bernoulli Booty Principle, as the number of positive qualities in a person increases, the possibility of that person being a Scientologist or hairdresser exponentially approaches infinity. With all that said, you still might be looking for the fastest way to get to a girl's heart. And nobody knows more about dating than YouTube's 2015 Sexiest Hands Alive, You Suck at Cooking. When I think of dating, I think of romance, and when I think of romance, I think of strawberries. It's been said that they teach us about vulnerability because they carry their seeds on the outside. Which is just like me, because on a first date, I bring a complete list of my insecurities, so that way we can start by having zero secrets. This allows us to get as close as possible, as quickly as possible, as forever as possible. And much like the strawberry, I also wear my sunflower seed headband, which not only shows my ability to be vulnerable, but also keeps the enormous amount of nervous first date sweat from drenching my face, body, and mustache. So those were some really good tips, but let's say you aren't a sex god and you want to know some practical advice. And I don't mean to brag, but one time I went on a date. So I would say the worst thing to do is be straightforward and honest about how you feel towards the other person. Like, if you're going to ask them out, don't say, hey, I think you're really cute. Do you want to get a drink with me sometime? I think a much better approach is to sort of do them small favors and slowly befriend them over the course of the next few years, and then when she develops feelings for someone else, just hope that it doesn't work out, and then she'll see that you're the one she actually liked the whole time. So yeah, just common sense, really. Yikes, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, okay. So anyway, I made that video, and I was, I was really excited because... Uh, I was like, I was like, holy shit, uh, man, people are gonna love this one. It's got me, it's got you suck at cooking, all the conspiracies are filled, like people are gonna love it on Reddit. This is gonna be great. So I made it and someone posted it on Reddit and uh, I could see it, like I put the link in and it was like, oh, this post has already been submitted because I'd use that to find the link. So then I'd find the link and it was like, this post has already been submitted. So I'd look and there it was and it had a few comments and a few likes and, uh, but it didn't show up in the Reddit feed. Uh, you could only find it if you had the link. And so it turned out that um, at that point, my channel had actually been blacklisted on Reddit uh, because people would like spam post it as soon as I uploaded it, so uh, uploaded something because, you know, the channel got popular on Reddit. As soon as I uploaded something, people made bots and uh, they themselves would go and quickly spam enter things. And for some reason, you know, Reddit's filter or whatever caught that and thought that it was just like, you know, bots or whatever. So... Um, just like, you know, me doing it or whatever. So the, it blacklisted my whole channel and, uh, I wrote to the mods and I was like, Hey guys, so, um, you know, this happened and like, I, I kind of get all of my views from Reddit and I think people like it. So like, is it possible that I could be unblacklisted? And the, the mods were just like, Oh, Hey man, really like your videos. Uh, but no, we can't do that. Uh, you're just going to have to wait for a few months until we, uh, redo the, the filtering system. And I was like, oh my God, are you serious? This was going to be like my big video. And then no one's going to see it. And then no one saw it. And I was like, oh God, oh, this is so bad. And so my video after that was on, um, I was like, okay, well, I just got to pick something I know and write about it and make it good and do my best. So I did one on uh, lifting, like go to the gym and stuff. And I made that and that was a good video. And it actually ended up being one of my more popular ones just over time. But at the time, no one watched it. Um, it, uh, I actually fortunately got a bit of luck because someone posted it on r slash bodybuilding and uh, memes aren't allowed on r slash bodybuilding, like videos, video memes aren't allowed, but uh, all the mods were away for the weekend because there was some thing that they were doing just coincidentally because there was like three mods and someone posted it while they were away just out of complete luck and it was on the front page there and I got some views and I was like, okay, I'm holding on to something. But then I made uh, casually explained 10 pieces of life advice on my birthday back then. And 
again, like all of these videos just basically performed to the subscriber count. There was no reaching. There was not really any growth. I was I was doing okay. You know, I had like 60 or 70,000 subscribers, which, to, you know, at the time, like it wasn't the same as the first month, but this is maybe two months after that. And I was like, man, this is still good though. This is still good going. Like as I, in my mind, I was like, am I going to be PewDiePie? Am I going to be grade A under A? And at this point I was like, okay, no, I'm definitely not. But I, I was like making this and I was like, okay, I can still grow something. This is still be something by the end of the year. So end of the school year. <clears throat> so I made the life advice video, which is on my birthday, which is just, you know, jokes about uh, life advice, etc. And uh, that one did okay. You know, if I had 70,000 subscribers, I think it got maybe 40,000 views. Uh, then I made one on magnets. And here's my thinking. I was like, you know, everyone's always like magnets. How do they work? And I was like, oh, why don't I do a video on magnets? I bet that would be good. And it wasn't. No one watched it. <laughs> 20,000 views. Then I made one on casually explained computers. And I thought that was quite a good video. But I, if, if I remember correctly, I haven't actually watched it since. But I thought computers was a pretty good video. And uh, it was kind of technically accurate as well. And uh it it did not very well on r slash videos because I, I figured out I could message the mods and if I did it fast enough and they were around, th they would uh, let each individual video through. But it was so slow that it didn't really help very much. So I did that. It did okay on r slash videos. Uh, it did well on like PC master race and like, you know, r slash computers or PC gaming or something like that. So I was like, okay, this video did a bit better, maybe 100,000 views, something like that. And uh, so I just made another video that was just a generic topic, which was social media. And uh, that was me trying to like plug my social media, like, oh, if I can start growing on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, like maybe they can come together like a bunch of overlapping Venn diagrams and the whole thing can build into something more substantial, you know, together. And so uh, what I started doing at the time, which, uh, well, one thing I started doing was like posting original jokes on Twitter, which ended up being a good idea. You know, it turns out it's not really that great. I mean, there's some good jokes. I actually, just, coincidentally, if you look right now, I had my most successful tweet I've ever had just today about Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> you can look at that if you want. But uh, posting original jokes on Twitter, because I thought that was a good way to, you know, uh, post something native to that. And then with Facebook, uh, at that time, um, there was a bunch of YouTube channels that were um, advocating like, man, there's all these Facebook pages stealing content off YouTube and they're just ripping it and posting it. And we have to boycott this. We have to fight back. We have to blah, 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 blah. And I was thinking at the time, I was like, I don't think this is right. You know, like, and they're like, oh, you know, when they get a million views, they're stealing these views from you. And I was like, that's not, that's not true. That's not how it works. And so what I did that I, I'm really happy that I did and overall that no one else was doing at the time is I messaged the big pages that were basically stealing content or some of them weren't, but some of them were. And I said to them, hey, if you want to post my content, which they were doing, um, you can post any of it that you want, but just link to my Facebook page and link to my YouTube channel in the comments. And they said, yeah, sure. That sounds good. And we ended up just having a good, you know, sort of ongoing relationship built on that. And I also started posting natively to Facebook. And to me, I didn't want to do that. And no one else on YouTube wanted to do that because then you give up views and you give up views the moment you upload. Like, you, you know, you don't have that same burst damage of viewership, if you know what I mean. So I did that. I uploaded natively to Facebook and uh, made yeah, collaborations with these um, Facebook pages. And uh, in the end, I feel fast forward all this time because my hope was um, that they were going to introduce Facebook monetization several months after I started doing that because that's what they were saying. They were testing it. They were going to do it in a few months. And I was like, once this kicks in, these big pages are going to have to split revenue. And then it's going to be a really advantageous situation to be in to have um, this relationship with them. It turns out that it took about three years for them to actually finally come out with Facebook monetization. And so then, you know, it was kind of a waste from that regard. But my Facebook page has ended up with, say, 500,000 followers, I think, which is way more than most YouTube channels have. And from working with these other uh, big pages, you know, sure, they probably got 100 million views off of some of my videos, which is, you know, clearly not equitable for what I got out of it. But in the end, you know, I would say I probably got maybe 200,000, 250,000 subscribers and uh, a bunch of views off of that. So I'm happy that it went that way instead of trying to boycott everything. So that's just a little small tangent that I thought was sort of relevant to the history, but maybe not all that interesting. But so then after that, I just kept making these videos that were just kind of 
six or 6.5 out of 10 videos, you know, like, eh, all right, it's a video. And so the next one was a casually explain Donald Trump. And that one was fine. Same thing. If I had 100,000 subscribers by then or 150,000 subscribers, it got about 80,000 views. Then I made casually explain French, which I thought was a pretty funny video. I think at the time it was a pretty good one. And uh, that got maybe 150,000 views. And it kind of got spread around a few, you know, language communities. And then, you know, in France, a few people watched it. So that helped the viewership. Um, and so I was, you know, around 200,000 subscribers at that point. And I was halfway through my second semester. And um, that's when I came out with my most successful video of all time. Thanks to Jimmy called Is She Into You? And that pretty much catapulted me from 200,000 to 400,000 subscribers and made me think, holy shit, I could do this as a job at some point. And uh, I'm not going to quite get into the story behind that or show it to you yet. We're going to save it for a little bit later. Save it for a little bit later, so you have to stay tuned. But the next video, um, my whole attitude changed towards YouTube because Ishii and you came out. I had all these extra subscribers. It was nearing the end of the first semester. And uh, I said to myself, uh, I want to make videos that are like Ishii and I want to make ones that are like this one long narrative that sort of arches over the whole, uh, arches over the whole um, video. You know, I didn't want it to just be like, here's five talking points and I'm going to make some jokes about each of them. I want it to be one whole video all the way through like Ishii into you because that's what just worked for me. So I came up with a video called Casually Explained Procrastination. And uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, if I can figure out how to start it. So I'm not going to lie to you. The other day I was doing my usual thing on the computer, minding my own business, when suddenly I'm not usually one to panic, but this was a 2,500 word technical report that I hadn't even started. But if there's anything I know about myself, it's that once panic takes over, anything is possible. In the first 15 minutes, tabs are flying open. I'm looking at six sources at once, 200 words per minute with one hand, no problem. I've done this before and there's not a doubt in my mind that this time will be any different. 30 minutes in, I'm about halfway through. My senses have evolved to absorb everything in my surroundings, every pixel on the screen, every sign of life, and every creak of the door. But I don't know if I can keep it up. I'm getting tired. My hands begin to cramp. I start slowing down, but I keep pace by making each stroke more deliberate than the last. A bead of sweat runs down my forehead and my eyes start to glaze over, but I know I'm getting close. But after 45 minutes, I start to feel weak. My hands are almost completely numb and I realize I haven't blinked once. Looking at what's in front of me, I can't help but wonder how I let myself get here in the first place. I close my eyes. What's wrong with me? How could I ever amount to anything if I keep doing this? I get a grip on myself, but my legs are still shaking. I reopen my eyes and suddenly I'm overcome with an incredible feeling. I've made it. I had the final touch. I finished. I look at the clock and I still have five minutes. I take a breath. All right, time to start the report. And, okay, so, uh, <laughs> and like the theme with that one is like, okay, right, it's a two minute video about me <laughs> jerking off, right? And, but this is what I was thinking. I was like, this is going to be a real banger because people are going to watch it twice. And I wrote the whole thing. So like everything would, uh, everything you could watch it again and it would be it would, knowing the punchline and it would be even like make more so i don't know if, if i'm just being stupid right now but i'm gonna play it again and i want you to like watch it with the context of what i just said oh this is a top secret video that i'll show you later so i'm not gonna lie to you the other day i was doing my usual thing on the computer minding my own business when suddenly
I'm not usually one to panic, but this was a 2,500 word technical report that I hadn't even started. But if there's anything I know about myself, it's that once panic takes over, anything is possible. In the first 15 minutes, tabs are flying open. I'm looking at six sources at once, 200 words per minute with one hand, no problem. I've done this before and there's not a doubt in my mind that this time will be any different. 30 minutes in, I'm about halfway through. My senses have evolved to absorb everything in my surroundings, every pixel on the screen, every sign of life, and every creak of the door. But I don't know if I can keep it up. I'm getting tired. My hands begin to cramp. I start slowing down, but I keep pace by making each stroke more deliberate than the last. A bead of sweat runs down my forehead and my eyes start to glaze over, but I know I'm getting close. But after 45 minutes, I start to feel weak. My hands are almost completely numb and I realize I haven't blinked once. Looking at what's in front of me, I can't help but wonder how I let myself get here in the first place. I close my eyes. What's wrong with me? How could I ever amount to anything if I keep doing this? I get a grip on myself but my legs are still shaking. I reopen my eyes and suddenly I'm overcome with an incredible feeling. I've made it. I had the final touch. Mm. I finished. Mm. I look at the clock and I still have five minutes. I take a breath. All right, time to start the report. All right, so it makes you think, right? Makes makes you think. Makes you think. Okay, so back to the back to the podcast screen. Uh, <laughs> so I thought it was pretty good, you know. Like when I made that video, I was like, "Damn, this is a good, this is a good fucking video." You know, I know what I'm doing. I'm I'm a YouTube content creator. I'm coming off is she into you? I'm the best. You know, I get views, bro. And so I made that video, and it did okay. And I was like, guys, like I don't even understand. Like it's so good. You watch it twice. Everything applies to both situations. I thought it was really good. I still think it's. I still like that video. Uh, but anyway, that one did fine. I made another one called Casually Explained Finding a Job, which was that same theme, and that one did okay. And I'm just kind of like ch chugging along where I have these videos that are just, it's like hit, miss, 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 hit, miss, miss. And I'm like second guessing myself, like struggling to figure out what is this formula for success. Um, after that, I make a video called uh, Evolution 2. And that was the first moment where I was like, oh man, I could reuse the same theme twice. That's not a bad idea. So I did that. And that one went really well. It was a good video, I think. And then I did one called uh, Casually Explained Back in My Day. And Back in My Day was sort of making fun of my dad, telling these stories of his past where everything was, you know, more difficult, you know, walked uphill both ways in the snow type of stuff. And uh, I made this video and I thought it was really good. And then uh, no one really liked it. It was like one of my worst videos in a long time. And I was like, I just don't understand what I'm doing. You know, I was just really lost. I realized like I had parts of me that could make a good video. But there were still huge parts of me that just didn't have anything calibrated right. And I was like, how, how, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to make something successful again? And I thought, I know I will make another relationship video. So then I came out with probably one of my top three most successful videos, which is casually explained the friend zone. It's pretty, I, I think it's a pretty good one. I'll take a, take a look, take a look at it. So, fundamentally, the friend zone is a bit of a relationship purgatory where, although it's not exactly gender exclusive, it's more often than not when a guy's sexual interest in a girl is met with only platonic friendship. And realistically, it's totally fine for a girl to like a guy's personality, but not really be interested in a relationship. The trouble usually comes from the fact that a lot of the time, guys don't even realize they've been friend zoned. And this can happen for a lot of reasons, but sometimes, even though a girl might not be interested, a guy can misinterpret the signal she's giving off and get too attached. So if you're a girl, try to avoid being in the same room, looking in our general direction, or winking both eyes at the same time. And sometimes, if a guy really doesn't get it, you might have to clearly tell him that you're only friends, or he's probably going to end up with hurt feelings at one point or another. Like I was recently at Starbucks, and there's a really cute girl taking my order, so we chatted for a second, and she asked for my name to write on the cup. And when I got my drink, I saw that my name had two hearts around it. And that was honestly one of the best feelings of my life. And I was about to say something when I saw that she also drew a couple of hearts for a guy named Aaron right behind me. Fucking slut. Now, I'm sure some of you are wondering if you're in the friend zone right now. And it usually progresses in stages, so you can see which one you might fall into. 
The first stage is denial, which is believing you aren't in the friend zone. The second stage is anger, which is coming to the realization that maybe you are. The third stage is bargaining, which is begging to take her on a date even though she's always showing you pictures of other guys. The fourth stage is depression, which is realizing she was showing you those pictures because she thought you were gay. And finally, the fifth stage is acceptance, which is realizing that one of them's pretty cute and what do you have to lose? Now, the most important question of all is can you get out of the friend zone? And interestingly, not too long ago, I was reading that a few psychologists at Penn State actually compiled a practical guide for men to get out of the friend zone. This looks like this. Of course, the first thing is identifying you're actually in the friend zone, then you execute the following steps. Step one, be more attractive. It's worth mentioning while this guide is certainly effective, it can be kind of difficult to implement and at least takes a bit of time. So one last piece of advice I was given a while ago was if you're ever in doubt, ask the girl out. The logic being that she either says yes and that's great, or she says no and you have your answer. But I've realized that this saying greatly underestimates my power for debilitating retrospection, which is why next time we're talking about how to get out of the friend zone and into the friend with benefits zone, where nothing goes wrong and no one gets too attached. All right. All right, so, we're, so that one came out. So the friend zone came out. And uh, with the friend zone uh, coming out after Evolution 2 and Ishii into You, and that did really well. Friend zone did very well. I felt like I was coming into what in hindsight was like the golden, the golden age of Casually Explained, where everyone who read it was like, oh my God, I love this novelty. Plus, the, he's re you know, I feel like I was at the time really hitting my stride with some of these videos. I was getting over a lot of the sort of... Um, you know, the bad jokes that I'd always make and I kind of figured out what was, you know, g necessarily not good and how to cut that out and spending time where time needed to be spent. And so the next one after that was uh, Casually Explained Guide to College and University. That one did pretty well. Then Casually Explained the Bar. That one did a little bit, not quite as well, but still did fine. And uh, I was kind of like um, getting into this mode that I felt very comfortable because I started using Photoshop. I evolved from MS Paint. I uh, decided to shell out the big bucks for the Adobe suite. And so I was making things with a little bit higher quality. I felt like I was making videos with more substance. I kind of fell into this uh, idea where instead of, you know, having to do, um, you know, everything that's, it's, you know, it's on a topic and it's like speaking from my exact personal experience and like being very mathematical and kind of sciencey. I was like, you know what, I can kind of loosen up with these a little bit. And so the next successful one uh, that I came out with was um, casually explained the spectrum of intelligence. And the reason I was really happy with this one is it was the first really successful one I had in a long time that wasn't to do with relationships or like social stuff in the same way that it was before. And so that was really reassuring to me because I was like, oh, well, people just want to watch these ones about relationships. People just want to watch these ones about people. And then, uh, I, you know, that's all that I kind of really was doing. And this video game thing. So this was like, okay, I'm going to do something that's, you know, it, it, it's a little bit about people, but it, it's still just a topic, you know, and this, this, that's what I was going to give it a go. So I'll show you guys uh, that one. While animals come in many different shapes and sizes, there are definitely some that are more intelligent than others. While you can't directly compare between species, I tried to put them in an approximate... Oops, sorry I didn't change the thing. ...that order. At the bottom of the spectrum we have extremely basic creatures like jellyfish and worms. While some have simple organ systems, none of them are capable of complex thought and quite linearly respond to external stimuli, a bit like little robots. A bit above there we have animals like small reptiles. These creatures have the fight-or-flight response that helps them eat things or avoid getting eaten. In humans, this is the same physiological response that ruins my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Literally right now. Farther along the spectrum, we have small mammals like mice or rats, both capable of learning new behavior and can be trained to some degree, often used in drug trials as a human analog because of their similar biology and accessibility. So moving on from there, we have some large mammals like elephants. I knew that historically they could be trained as war animals and for circuses and stuff, but I didn't really know to what degree. But I was watching an IMAX documentary recently, and they actually said, Some elephants are thought to be as intelligent as an eight-year-old child. So pretty stupid. A couple of the most intelligent animals are dolphins and gorillas. If you watch a video of dolphins playing around, they're almost eerily human-like, and gorillas are one of the only non-human animals to have been observed to use tools. And let me tell you, if you thought dropping your kid in the dolphin enclosure was fun... Just a thought.
Now, of course we have humans, but because humans have higher absolute intelligence, the difference between individuals can be quite substantial. So near the bottom of that spectrum, we have people who tell you they're really smart. Uh, I briefly knew a girl who prefaced her opinions with, I am actually very intelligent and read a lot. Uh, one time I told her I thought her chemtrail stuff was a bit of a conspiracy, and she said, did you even read my most recent Facebook post? So I expected to see a link to someone's sketchy blog, but it just said, Jessica's IQ is 135. Last I heard, she's reselling essential oils and cosmetics to an increasingly diluted client base. At least it's a business model that she could understand. A triangle. So leaving that behind is a distant memory. Next we have the average person. Has difficulty opening clamshell packaging, but can usually figure it out eventually. Can plug in a USB after only two or three tries. Doesn't quite get standing back at airport baggage claims or subway terminals, but knows how to Google something before giving up. After that, we get to gifted individuals. These are people who are capable of more advanced social and logical feats that may seem impossible for the average person, such as intense and prolonged concentration, deep understanding of other people and their emotions, and being able to request a haircut without rehearsing beforehand. So beyond that, we have everyone on the internet between 15 and 21. Now, unfortunately, in order to be a more notable genius, you have to not only be very intelligent, but highly dedicated. They say that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, but I found one of the best ways to give up on your dreams is to type them into the YouTube search bar, then add, done by a five-year-old Chinese girl. Lastly, people say that intelligence mostly comes down to genetics, but hard work comes down to willpower and dedication, which mostly comes down to motivation and ability to create actionable plans, which is a big part of intelligence. But always remember, no matter how notable or intelligent someone else is, you're always smarter or better than them in some way. They say Mozart could rewrite any song after only hearing it once. I have Spotify. Stephen Hawking advanced our understanding of the universe. Fucking smoked him in the hundred meters. Jesus could turn water into wine. I'm not a Jew. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> All right. So uh, you know, just so you know, that last joke ran it by Jimmy. He said it was okay. <laughs> no Johns, but you know, it's not on me. Uh, okay. So. Uh, Back to the story. Let's go back to the story. Uh, where were we? Okay, so moving on from there, we just had the spectrum of intelligence, and I promise you there's not a ton more of these that we're going to go through um, in case uh, you're like, holy shit, we're like not even a quarter of the way through. Um, but so after that video, um, I was feeling pretty good, and I was starting to get a little bit of my kind of like delivery down, uh, so to speak, in the sense that... Uh, I was like, oh, you know, I feel like I'm kind of getting my voice right. It's sounding a little bit more natural. I mean, it still sounds pretty awkward, but I was getting a little bit better. And so after that, I made a, I started making these short videos for uh, Thrillist, which is a um, sort of a, I think a New York based sort of online magazine company or whatever you want to call it. And they were like, hey man, we want you to make like six one minute long videos and we'll pay you like a thousand bucks for each of them. And I was like, oh my God, a thousand dollars. That sounds fantastic. So I made six of these videos, one each month. And uh, dude, it was like such a, it was, it was a good experience, but it was so bad. Like everything I'd make, I'd be like, oh man, like, what do you think of this? And they're like, oh, we'd actually prefer if he didn't swear. And I was like, what about this? And they're just like, oh yeah, that's good. But you know, instead of, uh, you know, instead of this, I think our viewers would like this. And it was just like, Oh no, no, that's not funny. No, no, <laughs> but I had to do it anyway because I was getting paid. And so I uploaded and with part of the arrangement, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. But I want to be able to upload them to my own YouTube channel so I could get at least something out of it beyond just the payment. And they're like, okay, sure, after a month or two. So I uploaded the casually explained brunch and then later casually explained ordering coffee. And I, th those were two that I uploaded. There's actually four more that are lost on the internet, on Thrillist's Facebook page, and no one has ever seen them except people who follow Thrillist. So just so you know, if you uh, ever decide to go on a deep dive, maybe you can find four more videos uh, beyond the ones in my profile page. And so then after that, um, I just went on this bit of a theme where I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna make like two videos that are about some random topics and then I'm gonna do one on relationships because it was just like every single one I did on relationships, it was just like, it was just a hit. And so I was like, I don't wanna oversaturate them with these videos, but I still like, I, you know, I gotta, I, I think these are, you know, people are really liking them. So I did uh, casually explain body language, 
um, and that one was really popular. That was great. And then I did casually explain the club, and uh, I'm just going to see where I'm at here for the time. Uh, so let's uh, skip to that. Skip. Uh, skip ahead here. So then, uh, so this is the body language one, and this was one that I thought was quite good. I seem to remember, as far as my, <laughs> I mean, it sounds pretty stupid because I'm like, oh, yeah, so I did this one, it was pretty good. I did this one, it was pretty good. And it's like, I'm only saying that because I remember at the time, I was like, wow, this is better than my average one. And I'm also cherry picking these, uh, just so you know. I've only picked, I think, 14. It says 15 here, but I picked like 14 videos. Uh, and uh, out of like 55, so, you know, at least that's why I'm saying it. So we'll take a look at this one. I think when it comes to dating, guys are often looking for the perfect thing to say to a girl and completely miss out on the importance of body language. And being able to read how a person feels is really key in developing a successful social relationship. So I want to go through the three-stage body language checklist that you can use on your own. Of course, stage one is the first encounter, and the first way someone will show interest is usually eye contact, and a few things can happen afterwards. A shy girl might look flustered and look away quickly, while a confident girl will hold eye contact and smile or maybe even wink. And the best course of action here is to live off that high for the rest of the week. After that, you have to watch out for proximity. Uh, once someone knows about you and likes you, they'll try to be around you as much as possible. This might sound kind of creepy, but it's pretty normal, and particularly guys are notorious for doing this. One of the best ways to make sure you're being romantic instead of creepy is to be above a 7. Now, at this point, hopefully you've gathered that there might be some chemistry and you guys have started chatting. Uh, oops, sorry adding a little bit. This is stage two, building rapport, and it's where most dating takes place. Uh, you want to pay attention to any subtle physical contact. A good indicator of interest during conversation is if the girl touches you lightly on the arm or dick to emphasize a point. You might occasionally meet someone who likes to break the physical touch barrier with a high five. It can be hard to tell if she's doing it to congratulate you or because she wants to touch your hand, so I like to remove ambiguity by making sure all my accomplishments are particularly underwhelming. Uh, along with that, you want to pay attention to her posture. Uh, people tend to cover their wrists and neck when they're uncomfortable, so if she is comfortable being around you, she might let her hands rest on the table or show more of her neck by tilting her head to the side. Keep in mind it could just be Lou Gehrig's. Okay, so this one you can experiment with. Uh, if someone wants to feel closer to you, they'll try to remove any barriers, like a cup or bag, from between your personal spaces. Uh, sometimes if I feel a girl thinks I'm alright, I'll try to see what she does if I put something between us that stops her from talking to me. I usually just use my personality or stay at home, but you can also build a menu for it and say you make YouTube videos. And uh, of course she can make more obvious gestures like licking or biting her lip. That's pretty hot. So if all the boxes are checked nice. so far, hopefully you're thinking, hey, we're having a great conversation, lots of laughing, physical contact, everything is going well, and you're ready for stage three, fucking it up. Uh, really, this stage is pretty intuitive, but can take anywhere from 30 seconds to 10 or 15 years, so remember to be patient. A few of the more common signs are you've seen them recently, but they haven't seen you. Uh, they have a kid and it isn't yours. <laughs> they have a kid and it is yours. And sometimes just not realizing anything is wrong at all. At any rate, don't stress everything on the checklist. Uh, it can all really be boiled down to just be yourself. Man, Jimmy, always, always sneak it in there. Always oh, sneak it in there. Okay, okay, moving on. Let's see, let's see where we're at now. All right, so then... Uh, oh, man, okay, so that was body language. So then after body language, um, I made uh, the club. I made casually explained, casually explained. Uh, those are both pretty decent. I actually really liked casually explained the club. That's probably one of my favorite videos. Um, I had it in the presentation, but we're going to skip past that one and go to uh, the next relationship one. Because again, this is the golden era of casually explained where every video is a relationship video. Is uh, And I think this one has a little bit of a funny story to go with it. So I'm going to pause it halfway through. But this is casually explained uh, breaking the ice. If you're like me, you never get approached by girls unless they're selling cookies. And beyond that, unless you're really attractive, famous, or have a puppy, it's all on you to break the ice with someone. You might be thinking, wow, that sounds unfair. What kind of double standard is this? But remember, don't hate the player, hate the game. Which I do. The good news is that because it's hard, that means if you're good at it, you really have a big step up on the people who refuse to try. Remember, when you're approaching someone, if you're just not weird, you're doing better than 95% of people. But as they say, easier said than done. 
Let's say you see a girl at a bar and you want to go talk to her. You think, uh, maybe I should walk by to see if I hear anything in the conversation that might imply she's single, or maybe I should get my friend to spill a drink on her friend so she'll be alone and I can swoop in. Ask yourself, what would a not weird person do? Probably go up to her and say, hey, I thought you were really cute, I wanted to come talk to you, what's your name? You probably won't catch a response the first time because you forgot to breathe and might be having an aneurysm. This is normal, just sit tight and wait for the alcohol to give you a personality. So what if you're at school or work and there's someone you have a big crush on, but you're worried about messing it up because you're still going to see them nearly every day? You might be thinking, I'll just play it cool, hope we get put in the same group. Okay, so I have to stop it here because this is where the interesting story is. Uh, this is uh, Women's Studies, Groups are Hands-On Project, and uh, this is a reference to uh, when Jimmy... <laughs> Jimmy was taking a philosophy of sex and love and uh, he was also taking women's studies I believe so this is a joke about that and so at the time Jimmy was like yo dude I'm telling you there's like this nine in my class dude like there's this nine and she's like from Sweden or some shit and I'm like oh what's her name because I was gonna look her up on Facebook and Jimmy's like I don't know dude it's like it's like Ula or like so you know some like Swedish shit dude like I don't know she's just hot though she's just hot and I was like oh okay all right that sounds great Jimmy so I was like gonna gonna uh so I was like I'll put it put it in this video and so I was like oh the nine with the foreign name like Jimmy will find that funny because it's also women's studies right and uh hang on a second I just want to make sure I have the right window open here yeah and so, okay, so coincidentally at the time, uh, there's this person that I was sort of seeing, uh, like, so, like we're, we're sort of friends, we're sort of seeing each other, it was like, you know, kind of that not quite sure what stage it was, right? And like, like it could, this could have literally been her. She has the most foreign fucking last name of all time. I, so there's this person that I was like sort of, you know, talking to or was seeing or whatever. So she has the most foreign name imaginable. And like she was, she watches my videos, so she inevitably saw this. And there's like a hundred percent chance that she thought this was her. And I was like, in hindsight, I was like, oh my god, I'm such a fucking idiot. Like she's gonna think that's her, and be like, oh, okay, that's a little bit weird. But then I was like, you know what? Like maybe she just be complimented. You know, like it's a women's studies groups for hands-on project, the nine of the four. Yeah, maybe she just be like, oh, that's nice. She's like. That's a, that's a nice thing to say about someone that you're just sort of dating. I don't really know. And then I was like, that's fine. But then I remember what came immediately after that. Group at some point and I can scope it out. Or maybe I should just walk up to her and say she looks exactly like my really hot sister. Ask yourself. <laughs> so, so I was like, oh my god. <laughs> complete fucking idiot. <laughs> and so anyway, long story short, uh, we saw each other for about a month and then that didn't work out. So what would a on. not weird person do? That's right. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Pastor. Now, it's not a bad idea to have a few go to openers if you're in the same environment all the time. I think pickup lines are pretty dumb because they're really just jokes. But if I'm in the gym, one of my go to's is damn, nice glutes looking thick. Mind giving me a spot? Then when they say okay, I just say, thanks man, and take it from there. One of the keys of making a good first impression is if the other person thinks you're both similar. So saying something you think the other person will relate to is a great idea. If I'm in the bar on slam poetry night for half price beer, there's a lot of lingering anxiety and existential dread in the room that can only be expressed through metaphor and loose rhyme. So what I like to do to show I'm on the same page is sit next to someone and say, Hi, I'm James, what's your name? Oh, nice to meet you, Hope. Oh man, this stool sure is flimsy. All we need now is a rope. <laughs> on the same note when I was- That one's also based on a true story. Taking engineering at university and I just wanted to make friends. My go-to icebreaker was sitting next to someone and saying, Hey man, have you ever touched a woman's hand? Then they usually laugh nervously and I say, Don't worry, me neither. And give them a high five. Then I say I think it would feel like that but a bit softer. Sad times. That one's also based on a true story. <laughs> At this point, I wanted to mention that if you're a girl, every guy on earth would appreciate if you approached us first once in a while. Even if we aren't interested, it's really flattering because it almost never happens. In fact, in my entire life, I've been asked out by as many gay guys as I have girls, which is zero. So what I'm saying is if I could get on the scoreboard in any way, that would be nice. Now, if you're going to approach someone, you might be thinking, uh, what if I get rejected? That would really hurt my ego and lower my self-esteem. Was well, that really as bad as living with the regret of not doing anything and wondering what could have been? 
If you're as fragile as me, it definitely is, which is why I have a permanent arsenal of coping mechanisms on standby, and I avoid difficult situations. But with that said, you can't expect someone or something to just fall into your lap, so sometimes you have to remember that rejection is just part of life, and you might have to be a little bit courageous. <laughs> okay, right, that's one. <laughs> All right, that's where that's where it was going. Okay, good job, good job, Jamie. Okay, so uh, back we go. We're okay, we're making some progress here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I'm not even gonna read the Twitch the Twitch chat on that one. I don't want to see what people said. Okay, so we're closing in. We're closing in. We're making progress. It's taking a little bit longer than I thought, but uh, it's still gonna be just fine. I hope. <clears throat> Okay, so then after breaking the ice, um, same thing, same theme. This is the golden era of casually explained. I made casually explained behind the scenes. Um, I made uh, casually explained the future. That one did fairly well. Casually explained, casually explained red flags. Another relationship one, same thing. And then this, uh, then after that, I made um, had a successful YouTube channel. Uh, casually explained flirting, which did okay. It was like the first um, relationship one that didn't quite do uh didn't do quite as well and then i feel like at that point we got into what i considered the modern era <laughs> the modern era of uh my video making career where uh the first the first video i made came out where i was like okay this is kind of like an actual i really felt it was really polished and i felt like the the production of it was good even though it probably looks the same to everyone else but um this is a uh, casually explained evolution three life is a video game and this was really the culmination of this idea that i had for a long time of the evolution series which is i wanted to do a video that was like oh what if you could be like an alien like imagining like pretending you're like an alien and you're just reviewing life as a human being you know it's like if you're a human being what would life be like and you'd be like oh yeah you have to do this it's pretty shitty you know you have to deal with your parents or whatever it's pretty bad or like you know just random shit like that and then it eventually turned into this um uh, this video, which is Casually Explained Evolution 3 Life as a Video Game, which is one of the absolutely, it did well on YouTube, relatively speaking, but it did absolutely insanely well on Facebook. And this is where that whole culmination of, you know, the, the, the random, um, uh, the, the random, uh, you know, the Facebook stuff I was talking about finally came into play where I got the subscribership and viewership from uh, that whole operation. So let's take a look at that one. So, since the first playable characters came out, the devs have been working on the human player type for what seems like 3 billion years, and I'll admit that I haven't even gotten through all the levels yet, but I've been pretty impressed so far, so I wanted to give a critical review of the current content. Now, if this is your first time playing, I definitely recommend picking one of the starting regions with lower difficulty, which I put in green here. Um, all the servers are getting pretty overpopulated right now, so you can pick one of the yellow regions if the recommended ones are full, but really try not to go for the areas in red unless you really know what you're doing or are just trying to speed run the game. Pretty much all areas are player versus environment zones, but there are a few player versus player areas around here. And if you really want to play on a private server, you can do that over here. But the admins aren't so great, and it sucks if you change your mind because after you're there, you can't leave, so I'd probably give it a miss. Okay, at the start you have to choose a race, and in the past Caucasian male was definitely the most OP, but they've all become a lot more balanced in more recent patches, at least in the easier starting regions, but if you look at the race perks tab, still some nice privileges with this choice, so that's what I went with. Okay, so once you've chosen your starting region and race, you have to go through a 9 month loading screen while your character spawns, and that already sounds bad, but what's even worse is that once you've actually spawned, you have to go through 18 levels of tutorial. The first few of which are just interactive cutscenes. Even when you get to start moving around and interacting with the environment, what kind of sucks is that the only other users you really get to interact with are the two parent players that take you through the start of the tutorial. And the trouble is, if they haven't advanced their parenting skill tree, you end up with really screwed up stats for the rest Full of the game. Guy, dude. That's really oh, just down no. the RNG of who you get paired up with. So the first few levels of tutorial really aren't so memorable, but once you've made it to level 5 or 6, you've usually unlocked the friendship and knowledge trees, but you do have to spend around 6 hours a day at a learning academy to keep leveling that up. Okay, so as we get to about level 17 or 18, you basically finish the tutorial, and it turns out that the first thing you actually realize once you're done is that it had nothing to do with the rest of the game. And it turns out the whole tutorial is pretty much designed to sell you the college or university DLC, which is kind of overpriced for what you get, but if you decide to go for it, it can help you get a step up on free-to-play players in the mid-game. 
Um, so the mid game itself generally takes place between around level 18 and 65, where the two biggest focuses are on sustaining the newly unlocked relationship meter and generating in-game currency, which is usually denoted in dollars. So first of all, the relationship meter. Uh, this is the built-in drive to find a sexual companion, spend time with them, and reproduce. There are some factions where your parent players choose a companion for you, but in most of the Western factions you get to choose yourself. You might think that this is a way better idea, but the problem is they also have to choose you. So it might sound better on paper, but make sure you think out the gameplay. Now, when it comes to generating in-game currency, the most common strategy is to trade your playtime for dollars. Uh, if you see most users during this process, while they're technically still actual players, the majority of them are running scripts, so they're typically AFK and are pretty much indistinguishable from NPCs. So because it's an MMO, there aren't really any distinct objectives, and generally sometime during the mid-game you have to figure out what it is that you want to do. Uh, some players focus on their relationship meter, some on getting more dollars, some on really maxing out certain skill trees, and some struggle to figure it out at all. There's no right answer really, just like any other MMO, I think your goal is to just enjoy the time you spend playing without ruining it for other people, and hopefully when you're a higher level you can get to the point where you enjoy helping players who might be struggling. So when you do get to around level 65, they say you should be at the end game content, but in practice this is getting later and later all the time, despite the level cap remaining pretty much the same. But nevertheless, what's good here is that you generally have a pretty fulfilled relationship meter, your important skill trees are maxed out, you can generally spend the rest of your time exploring the map and doing the things you want to do. Trouble is that at this point it can be hard to actually do those things because you start to experience a lot of bugs with your character. This is just because with the amount of variation in each user's programming, you can't expect it to function perfectly after so many iterations. Around level 80 is when you'll really start to encounter a lot of errors, until eventually the screen just goes black and your playtime is over. A lot of users wonder what actually happens at this point, and no one really knows. Uh, some players think you respawn, some think you only get to play once, some even think you unlock a sandbox mode where you can basically just play over all the good bits on a special map. But you know, it doesn't seem to me like there's a big difference between before you start the game and after you finish, so don't overthink it and make the most of your playtime. Surprisingly wholesome. And so with that, uh, we only have a couple more videos that I'm gonna go through, but uh, that to me was one of the videos that I was the happiest making. When I made that, I thought to myself, this is a really, polished video that I actually feel proud that I've made because so many of them again they were like relationship ones and I was like making it because I thought it was going to be successful and I think some of them were pretty decent but overall I was like yeah you know it's, some are some parts are good some parts are bad but this one I was so happy with the way it came out and I was just it, again it did okay on YouTube but on Facebook it just went insane and uh that was really the the point that kind of um sort of uh carried my youtube channel uh, over the edge of you know where i was because at that time i had uh i guess i kind of skimmed over this but i i'd moved out from i'd finished my first year of school i uh i decided not to re-enroll in the second semester sorry the second year and i moved out i went away from home and uh well just locally but uh, i moved out from home had my own place and i was you know getting by and i was just kind of like well you know not super worried about, you know, like running out of money, like things are going, things going fine right now. But to me, that video was the first one where I was like, you know what, I felt I really dedicated time and effort to make something that was really polished and really, really good. And people really liked it. And I said to myself, you know what, if you really put your time and attention into making a video that you really believe in, then it's going to be good. And that was sort of the, a big, a big turning point for me. And then since then, you know, everything's just, you know, continues to go well and I kind of lost that fear that I didn't really know what I was doing in the sense that you know I had I was constantly thinking like if I had two or three videos that were bad or didn't perform well I was like this is it you know like people are bored this is you know this is this is when this is it it's over you know I had a good run but after that one I kind of thought you know what it really comes down to the effort and polish and the 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 good ideas and so, uh, oh man, I actually have to check which video I had lined up next. Oh man, oh, <laughs> this is not the one I thought I did, but uh, all right, that'll do. So at this point, it was just a matter of um, doing exactly that, putting the effort into make good content over and over and again. And so I made uh, 
One Night Stands, that one was uh, surprisingly not that successful, but over time it became one of the more successful ones and I'm gonna actually show that near the end because it has a really, ooh, no, I can't. I'm gonna save it for next week and I'll explain why in a little bit. But, uh, so I made Casually Explained Sports, which wasn't quite finished, it was a little unpolished, but it was kind of funny. Group Projects, I thought that one was gonna be really successful, but it was kind of average. I did uh, Casually Explained Finding the One, which was another sort of relationship one that I thought was, uh, that one was kind of fun. Um, and again, all of these, the thought process is just like, what is a topic that I think I can, that people are going to watch that I also have something to say. And, uh, that was something that, you know, this is why it often took a month or two months to make videos because so much of the time was spent writing something and being like, oh man, I'm sure people would love, you know, a video on music. And then I realized like, I don't know anything about music and this video sucks. So I would just can it, you know? And so, uh, one of the next ones I did that was successful was uh, video games. I was really happy with uh, the, the reception on that, even though I thought the video was kind of mediocre. But, um, I mean, that happens sometimes, and this is just all part of the process of figuring out what was, um, uh, you know, how, how that whole thing goes. And after that, I had a few videos that just weren't that successful. I did the, the solar system, not that successful. That was right around the solar eclipse. And uh, I did Evolution 4, which was a sort of a simulation of the universe as if it were a programming analog. And that wasn't that popular either. Uh, and I was starting to think, like, fuck, am I? Is this it? Like, I was rethinking myself and I was saying, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I've kind of, like, I've, am I running out of ideas? Is there just, like, is there something I'm missing? And I was, like, going through watching my videos over and over again. And I just, like, didn't get it. And I was just... I was like struggling again and I was like, you know what? And even at the time I was thinking like, what do I want to do? You know, like, what do I want to do with my time? What do I want to do with YouTube? I, at this point, like I was fairly comfortable at my place. You know, I wasn't like struggling to pay the bills, but I also wasn't, you know, you know, <laughs> rolling around at a hundred dollar bills or anything like that. And so I was thinking like, what the, what, what are my goals? What am I trying to accomplish here? Like, what's the motivation? Am I just going to be making YouTube videos forever until people just stop watching or I get bored or something, you know, my arm falls off or something like that. And so I was like, you know what I could do? It's like, what if I, what if I had this idea of making everything like 10 times more successful than it is? And I was like, well, would I even want that? Like, would you want to make like you know, PewDiePie money? Would you want to make Hollywood celebrity money? Like, is that even a thing that you would want? What would that look like? And so I made this next video, which is one that I'm really happy with. And it's one that, again, it, you know, after like seven or eight videos not being very successful, uh, this is one that I was really happy with. And it was to, to figure out, like, <laughs> is there something to this? And, and that one was, uh, uh, can I just explain? Levels of Wealth. When we think of money, it's usually in terms of what things we can buy with it. But your level of wealth doesn't only determine what you own, it can determine entirely what your life looks like, and I wanted to give a bit of an overview of what that could look like at some different intervals. Now, at the bottom of the pyramid, of course, we have the alcoholic, amphetamine-abusing lowlife who mooch off public services because they can't pay their debts or find a job. Fucking grad students. Disgusting. Next, we have the working and middle class, which makes up about 90% of the population. Even though it might seem like they can't accomplish much compared to the elites of society, members of the middle class can work together to become much more powerful. As an example, with one roommate they can afford rent, but with two they can afford furniture. The middle class earns up to 300000 a year, but the median individual income is a lot more modest at 38000 This can be pretty misleading though, because if you're 50 with a wife and two kids, 38k a year is pretty rough. But if you're 21 and single, you're buying resale Yeezys thinking, Man, I wonder how much sex I'd have if I didn't live with my parents. So in conjunction, I think there are a couple lifestyle indicators to check to see if you're in the middle class, such as your grandparents had five kids, your parents had three kids, and you're gonna put a stop to it once and for all. And you don't have an emergency fund because you figure that if you're on vacation, your appendix gives out, why would you spend 20K on surgery when you could just die? So moving beyond the middle class, we get to the start of your truly wealthy people. These are notorious 1% who typically have an individual income of 300,000 or higher or a net worth of over 8 million. Usually this means you have more than one home, active investments, travel whenever you want, and basically have the best of everything short of private jets and a Battlefront 2 season pass. But in the same way someone in the arts might wave their fist at an accomplished engineer, there's a huge difference between people within the 1%. As an example, if you're worth 75 million, 
You have the ability to see almost anyone in the world just by asking. But if you're worth 75 billion, you have the ability to see almost anyone in the world without asking. Once you're worth over $100 million, people use your first and last name when they talk about you. And if you're not famous, you at least have a Wikipedia page that you didn't make yourself. You likely make up to $10 million a year, which to compare with a more normal income is like going to Costco and paying $1.50 for a hot dog, but getting 100 hot dogs. I don't know why I left that in. Um, at this point, your wealth is almost magnetic to more wealth, and ironically, things start costing less. I could pay $5,000 for a Gucci suit, and people might think I'm cool, but if I were actually cool, Gucci would have paid me to wear it. While it sounds pretty great, you might start to wonder if people like you for you, or only like you because you're rich and famous. Fortunately though, you are rich and famous. So finally at the very top of the pyramid, we have the people worth over a billion dollars, the 0.001%. Guys like Elon, Jeff, Branson, and Bill. These people have so much money, they can literally change the world. Save the kids, done. Create your own space program, done. Dinner with the president, you are the president. You don't fly business, you buy the business. When you get pet supplies from Amazon, you mean the rainforest. And when you say, hey babe, how about I drive this time? You're talking to the car. If you look at the absolute top, Jeff Bezos recently overtook Bill Gates, and to be as rich as the two of them, you would have to earn about $5,000 every minute you were alive. They even said themselves, I don't think I could even spend the money if I tried. Fucking amateurs. Now with the pyramid capped off, if we step back, it does seem like the implication here is that your life gets better the more money you have, which brings about the age-old question of does money buy you happiness? And from what I've looked at, I think the best explanation is that money won't buy you happiness, but it can make problems go away that make you unhappy. Like when you go to take money out of your bank account and get charged a fee because there's no money in your bank account. Or when you buy tickets online, you have to pay extra for doing all the work yourself. With that said, I wanted to end it at that point, but I showed my friend and she said, is that it? Is it just first world countries? What about the rest of the world? And you know, like they say, you, you can't make your sneakers and wear them too. Um, the good news is that my demographics show that there aren't many people in third world countries watching my videos. They don't have internet. So um, we'll worry about that another time. All right. Did <laughs> Jin and Bobby Mishimi says, dang. <laughs> yeah, dude, anyway, I was super happy with that one because I feel it was one of the first videos too where I actually sounded like me. Like, if that makes any sense. Like, when I listened to all my old videos, I was like, it's like, hey guys, um, yeah, so then in this video, we're going to talk about you know, talking to your girl that you have a crush on. And I don't, I don't know why it was like that. I don't know if it was the microphone or just me, but I feel like in that one, I sound like me. <laughs> a confident man with billions of dollars. <laughs> How I truly see myself on the inside. And so anyway, that came out and uh, I was so happy because um, right around that point, I decided, I was like, you know what? I don't want to do besides one more if you actually look in the history but i was like i don't want to do any more relationship videos like it, part of me was like i think they're just like too cheap you know like i think it's becoming like a cliche i just don't want to do them i just want to make funny videos like i don't know if this makes any sense but like jerry seinfeld talked about this once where he said uh oh i i don't swear in my comedy because it's too easy and uh <laughs> like I mean, I think he's a fucking idiot, dude. Like, if I were doing stand up, like, I'm swearing 100%. I'll take the easy, I'll take the easy dollars anytime. And, like, that wasn't my version of this. I wasn't like, oh, relationship videos, too easy. You know, print me those views. Like, I wasn't thinking of that at all. I was just like, I felt embarrassed, you know? I was kind of like, the only thing that was carrying me through on my YouTube videos, the only ones that were getting any type of viewership that I was happy with were just relationship and social videos. And I was like, is this it? Have I just been like, and then also like, they're all kind of like, you know, all these videos were just basically around my, <laughs> my hypothetically around my, you know, failing relationships and, and, and foibles with women or whatever it may be. And I was like, nah, dude, I was like, I don't want this public perception. No, this ain't, this ain't me. Is this what I want to be known for? Nah, nah, ain't about it. Ain't about it. So I was like, okay, you know what? <laughs> Starting off with levels of wealth. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. So, uh, I, I mean, I will go back to it because I have some good ideas, but I mean, like I wasn't going to make that the crux of the channel. So then I made uh, a few other ones. I made introverts and extroverts, critical thinking, and then all the last ones they've made in the six months, which is, which is in the last six months has been like six videos, but, uh, you know what I mean? And so, um, uh, the, the last one that I wanted to show you was, uh, another one that I was really happy with that related to levels of wealth. Um, just because it was a similar style 
Uh, and it was one that I really felt I knew at least something about, which was uh, casually explained men's fashion. And I don't know a lot about men's fashion because I'm fashionable. I know a lot about men's fashion because all of my friends are very fashionable. And uh, I was like constantly being exposed to, you know, uh, they're like, oh, dude, like I got to wake up at five. I got to get these Yeezys, bro. I, I got I got 15 tabs open trying to <laughs> cop some fresh Yeezys. And I'm like, why are, you, why are you getting those shoes for like $600? And they're like, oh, because I'm going to sell them for $1,200. And I was like... Oh, okay. That that actually makes sense. Okay, that sounds good. And then like Sam was really into like all sorts of different shoes and different clothes and Jimmy and uh, I mean, they still all are but not to the same degree that they were uh, previously. And so a lot of it, I was just like, some of it, I was like, wow, this is really sick. Like, you guys look great. This is you know, good choices, you guys. But a lot of it, I was like, this is stupid. Like, like, to me, like, I was seeing like people my age, like walking around in Jordan's and like big basketball shoes and uh, Yeezys and like, you know, high fashion boots and shit. And it made no sense to me because they looked stupid. Uh, all the girls I knew were just like, yeah, well, most of them anyway were like, yeah, those are kind of dumb. What's the point of those? And uh, you'd see like kids in uh, middle school going around with the same shoes. And I was like, this is dumb. This is really stupid, at least those parts of it. And so I decided to make a video because I was like trying to wrap my head around it and uh, it ended up being one of the my uh, my uh, favorite ones that I you know Jimmy's just calling me out on having common projects. Yo, common projects are good, dude. Like I said, there's a lot of there's a lot of those things that I think are great, but there's a lot of them that I think are really stupid. So uh, anyway, this is this video is the last video I'm showing you, uh, and I was really happy with the way that it uh, that it came out. So the world of men's fashion is a wacky wild wild and turbulent place, especially thanks to the internet, where 10 years ago, if you discovered a men's fashion forum looking for advice, they'd say, eh, just wear jeans and a shirt that fits properly, and you'd be leagues ahead of your average dad just by doing that. Nowadays, while they already existed to some degree, those fashions and forms have diverged and then grown into huge subcultures that include things like your mainstream business attire, high fashion, casual wear, street wear, and all sorts of subgroups under that, including things like your sneaker heads, tech wear, skate wear, pale wave, avant-garde, and then everything Kanye has been in the same room as. On the surface, they all seem like completely different and confusing genres, but it's kind of like how there are a million types of movies, but they're all built on the same principles. So if you break it down into what the actual purpose or inspiration of the different trends are, it starts to make some actual sense. So to start with the obvious, you take business and formal attire, and it literally has barely changed for 125 years besides the fat conductor hats. A basic suit looks fantastic all the time, and the only way it doesn't is if it doesn't fit or you're wearing it at the wrong place. And that's the whole point. It's a super simple yet refined outfit that says, I'm a respectable, put-together person representing a respectable, put-together company, so sign this contract and let's monopolize American Steel. So as that devolves a little bit, you have something like business casual, which is of course much more prevalent nowadays as business has become a lot less face-to-face -face and a lot more online. Um, some people wear business casual or chic casual outfits all the time, but it works better if you're a bit older, because if you're a high school student or university freshman, it can come off as a bit incongruent because there's really no reason you'd ever need to wear a button shirt other than when your date drove you to prom or that one job interview you've had. So it might be good to wait until you've at least paid taxes before you look like you filed someone else's. So in my opinion, this is the point where things get interesting because you get to your casual, everyday clothes where you can really express your personality by copying what popular rappers are wearing. It's by far the most rapidly evolving area of men's fashion, and I think the most noticeable shift recently has been the huge prevalence of streetwear and designer brands gaining popularity with teenagers and young guys. I mean, not that long ago, the only people who'd spend money on Gucci were rich middle-aged guys buying their wife something for an anniversary, but nowadays the barrier for entry is getting like three A's that semester. The part that I found the most interesting about some of the streetwear culture is that a lot of unfashionable items are worn ironically, where you're sort of saying, I know so much about fashion that I'm wearing something I know is unfashionable, because in order to identify something so unfashionable, you would have to know a lot about fashion. Like a while ago, it would be as simple as wearing a pink shirt and putting your hair in a bun because it was the opposite of traditional men's fashion at the time. Then later it was overalls and a bucket hat because you live in a city and haven't ever caught a fish. And then eventually jean joggers and a NASA <laughs> fanny pack because you're emulating that one weird kid in middle school. I'm still sour about this because I was literally that kid in middle school and people did not think I was fashionable. I did, however, have a pouch for my laser pointer. Now, this sort of ironic incorporation of uncool items certainly doesn't end there because some brands seem to have been built almost entirely on this sense of consumer irony. And I think the most brilliant example of that is Supreme. And they were originally a much smaller kind of skate shop clothing brand, but effectively they said, 
All right, we're a pretty niche shop with a pretty dedicated clientele. Do you think people would buy just a regular white shirt with a box logo on it for $30? And it turns out they would. And as they got bigger, they said, all right, what about something like a Zippo lighter? And that sold out instantly. But as they kept getting more traction, they just said, fuck it. Nunchucks sold out instantly. Tennis balls sold out instantly. Fire extinguisher sold out instantly. And at one point, they must have had a conversation that went, all right. What is literally the least useful standalone item we could possibly sell? And someone said, how about a brick? Yeah, a brick. And look, Supreme was pretty big at the time and everything was selling out, but would people actually pay $30 for a brick? And of course the answer was no, they didn't. Almost no one would pay $30 for a brick. They'd pay $1,000 for a brick because it sold out instantly. So anyway, hit me up for that collab. Like, like actually though. So once you go deeper into different contemporary fashions, you find some very interesting subcategorizations that explore the extremes of other genres. And some of them are pretty weird. So the most well known is probably high fashion, which does get a lot of flack for being weird, but it's really more of an advertising campaign and for showing off a designer's inspiration for upcoming commercial lines than it is for actual practical wear. So in a way it's almost weird by design, which is neither here nor there for me. But if we start looking at the niche clothing that people do wear on a day to day basis, it brings us to some super interesting trends. So of course, a massive group that's permeated all casual wear are your sneakerheads, and these are the people you might have heard of who would camp overnight to cop a fresh pair of Jordans, but they only really wear them once for Instagram, and then they resell them the next day at five times the price to rich Asian exchange students. Something like Normcore is wearing literally your entire outfit ironically, effectively dressing as blandly as possible on purpose. Um, Pale Wave is a sort of minimalism that centers around a lack of detail and subtle pastel color palettes. I quite enjoy this look because if people come over to my apartment, I blend in nicely with my IKEA furniture. Uh, then there's all black everything, which is also a pretty solid choice if you don't like sorting laundry. I mean, I think it's cool because it makes your washer's spin cycle look like a portal to the fourth dimension. That's pretty neat. And then something like avant-garde, which is sometimes called goth ninja, is way more complicated, but is fundamentally about being able to sneak up on people, perfectly camouflaged in the urban environment, and then being able to tap them on the shoulder and they'll drop dead instantly. Um, lastly, we have tech wear, which is the most technically advanced clothing possible. Um, your jacket weighs about 14 micrograms and is resistant to all four seasons simultaneously. Your carbon fiber Gore-Tex underwear is completely waterproof from both directions and has a concealed pocket for up to two Magnum condoms. Honestly, the only downside I can find to a tech wear outfit is that it costs $4,000 and you only use it to walk to work. Now, at this point, we've barely scratched the surface of all the fashion ideas that are out there, but moving forward, all these areas of fashion will continue to evolve in some very interesting and unpredictable ways. Personally, I've been trying to pioneer Comfcore, which focuses on being as comfortable as possible at all times. The only downside that I've realized is that it's the literal opposite of fashion and usually devolves into you not leaving the house and binging YouTube top 10 lists. So yeah, no Instagram traction on that one yet, but I'll keep you guys updated. <laughs> All right, and so that, okay, so there you go. And the thing I was so excited about with uh, with that episode too is uh, it was during a period where I was trying to get my my work habits uh, um, my work habits kind of nailed down a little bit. So what I did was uh, I started taking my laptop to the university, even though I had no reason to be there. And so I went to the university, and I would just sit there and write stuff. And uh, you know, Jimmy worked at the. Uh, um, the cafe and so uh, I would go in and you know, he he'd be like, hey man, hey man, come over here dude, come over here dude And he'd like come, I'd shuffle to the side and he's like, yo man, I got you fam, I got you And, and he's like, what do you want, what do you want from me? And I was like, uh, can I just get like a coffee or something? Like a like a small iced coffee and he's like, yeah, I got you, yeah, I got you And then he'd make like, you know, a, a uh, an extra large like double caramel mocha with like whip and whatever the fuck And I'd be like, yo, thanks bro, thanks bro <laughs> And then I'd, uh, I'd get that, take it back to my, my, my seat and I would just like, you know, um, uh, write YouTube videos and try to make on, eye, co eye contact with <laughs> attractive girls and then glance back at Jimmy and we'd be like, uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, uh-huh. <laughs> but at any rate, I was so stoked because I wrote this whole video in three hours, which is the fastest I've ever wrote any video besides one other video, which is the one that I skipped from earlier that I've left to this moment because I wanted to save the story behind it because it's probably the most interesting. And that video is... 
I know a lot of guys have trouble picking up she on the signs you. of whether or not a girl is into them, so today I want to do a little quiz so you can see if she actually does like you, or even just how good you are at recognizing signals that you might be getting. Let's say you're in a bar and you look across the length of the counter and you see a cute girl who glances at you briefly, does a quick hair flip, and then turns back to her friends. Is she into you? Uh, eye contact is obviously a good sign, but you really can't tell from this example. She could just be adjusting her hair, and maybe she was looking at someone behind you. So, let's say you're at the office and your cute co-worker is waiting behind you to make some copies of whatever people make copies of, and she says, Wow, do you think you could go any slower? And then playfully punches your arm. Is she into you? Uh, again, you can't really tell from this example either. She might like you, but she might just be giggling and punching your arm as a sarcastic middle school throwback. So, really no way to tell. Okay, so let's say you're at the gym on the elliptical for some reason, and Cutie McBooty comes in and gets on the exercise bike in front of you. Uh, and then after five minutes, she looks back and says, Wow, I'm so sweaty already. If only there were a way to get the same workout at home riding something else. And then gives you a wink. She into you. Yeah, I still can't tell with that one. Um, exercise equipment is pretty expensive, and maybe she lives in a small apartment and just doesn't have space. So maybe you find a good deal on rowing machines somewhere, you can show her the flyer. Okay, so let's say you meet up with a friend that you've had coffee and drinks with a couple times, and she says, I had a lot of fun on the last few dates we went on. That's a good sign because she thought those hangouts were actually dates, so suppose then she says, How would you like to come back to my place and watch Netflix tonight? That's another good sign. Uh, it's usually a pretty good indicator when a girl invites you to do something, especially at her place. So then let's say later at her house you guys are watching Wally -E or something like that and she says, I'm getting pretty bored, why don't you come upstairs with me? That's another great sign. She probably has something pretty interesting to do upstairs if it's better than watching Wally. -E. So then after you go up there, all of a sudden she pushes you onto her bed, dims the lights, rips off her clothes, and you start having sex. Is she into you? Yeah, again, you really can't be too sure. It's pretty dark in the room, so she can't really see you properly. Maybe she's from Canada and was just being polite. Anyway, best bet is to just keep your wits about you and continue to look for signs. So you might be thinking, I don't know if you saw it. I know a lot of... What is this down here? What is that? What is this dedicated to Jimmy? Is it really dedicated to Jimmy? Is there something, something that we don't know? Something unknown? Is there a story to be shared? Is there something very interesting to talk about? I guess we'll find out next week on the Staying In Podcast number three, Valentine's Day special. <laughs> to have loved and lost and to have lost and then loved tune in next week <laughs> tune, in, tune in next week for the valentine's day special and so at this point uh we are now going to be going into some questions from the discord back we go to the podcast screen let's put on some nice uh little bits of piano music in the background That was good. That was a good one. Wow, so pleasant. All right. Okay, so let's take a look very quickly at a few questions from the Discord because we have gone over time. All right, let's see. <laughs> um. Beasley says, do you typically have to do any research for your videos or do you attempt to keep the topics to things you're already comfortable talking about? Um, I usually do try to keep things to topics that I have like lived through to some degree because I think those are the ones you can write the best about. However, there are some that get a bit obscure and I'll have to look up some references, but for the most part, I keep it to topics that I'm familiar with. Uh, oh no, Mess Express, sorry, I didn't make a pie chart. I was going to do that, I forgot, but... Uh, uh, to your question, can you produce a pie chart of your time distribution into categories such as researching a topic, writing the script, recording, editing, drawing, etc.? Um, if I were to just give you one right now, it would be uh, <clears throat> probably 60% writing, 30%, uh, no, that's not right, 50% writing, 40% uh, drawing, and 10% uh, editing and recording. 
Uh, Medium Messiah says, which episode did you put off the most? Not the one that took you the most time of actual work, but the one where you had to force yourself to finish because the thought was off-putting. Um, I'd have to say it's some of the recent ones. I've had a few struggles with some of the recent ones. Uh, I think Evolution 5, which is like the last evolution I'm going to be doing, that one took a bit... Uh, that one was a hard one to finish. Uh, let me just take a look really quickly. Creative process was hard to get done. Memes was hard because it was a long one. Um, so I'd have to say those ones, probably the creative process, the, the recent one, travel, uh, memes and evolution five, like those recent ones, they were hard ones to get through. I'd, I'd have to say, I have to say that would be the difficult ones. Uh, Drafter says, how many jokes have you written and decided they weren't good enough for videos? Um, a lot. But to me, whenever you think of a joke, almost always there, it's like a seed of something that could be better. So I always save things. I always save jokes. I always save topics. I always save paragraphs or things that I've written because you never know when you're going to start rethinking those ideas and you're going to have more stuff to add on to them later. And you can kind of revise the joke. Like as an example, if you actually go and look at, say, I was just mentioning this earlier, but on my Twitter, like I just had a, tw uh, a tweet that like is my most retweeted tweet ever and uh, about smash, like super smash. And like, the reason why it was so popular is because I had this old joke that was like, you know, when he's like, oh, when she says, hey, I'm home alone, why don't you come smash? And then it was a picture of me uh, carrying a GameCube controller and the GameCube controller was really blurred. And that was a really popular, you know, Twitter post. And I was like, I could do something new with that theme about Smash Ultimate. And I, I came up with a tweet that I, I just posted earlier today that did so well. And just because it's like the same premise but with new context, it can, you can make it way funnier and with a bit more time and effort. Um, <clears throat> what video is your favorite that you made? Not because of how much ad revenue it made you, but because of you genuinely, genuinely enjoy the topic or the way it came out. Um, that would be men's fashion and is she into you? Basically, the, the faster it is to write, the more I enjoy it because it usually is something I know really well or I just inspired to make it and I just can't help myself but just make it right away. You know, those are those are the ones. Um Ella Bell says, what is the hardest aspect uh about writing the scripts? And do you ever get stuck trying to fully flesh out and articulate an idea you have? Uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, because I've always found the most successful videos are the ones that are based on stories and experiences and uh, how I would relate to something. Whereas, uh, like, one that I, like, say, like, the casually explained introverts and extroverts, like, there's so much research that goes into, you know, personality studies related to introverts and extroverts that it's just, there's so much depth there to understand in the real world. And it's like, that was probably the thing I spent the most time reading and researching because I was just interested in it at the time. And I was like, oh, I'll make a video about this because I think people would be interested in introverts and extroverts. And uh, as I was writing it, like everything, like I just realized that making like what I would consider the best jokes I could did not go in accordance with writing with as much specificity, specificity and, uh, you know, like if I wanted to bring out like really sort of like nuanced information that I'm like, holy shit, I spent, you know, 50 hours reading about this and this is what I learned. It's like, if you want to do that, you can't also write the funniest joke that you can. Um, and uh, that was a weird kind of, you know, back and forth that I kind of had. Cause like, you know, obviously my, my, <laughs> I, I, I'm not an expert in any particular field of anything but uh i kind of realized like man sometimes when you really know about not when you really know about when you really search out like the facts it's hard to make jokes about facts you know it's almost like you have to have an experience and an anecdote to 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 make some make something funny out of it. and i was like that's what i kind of realized from that video i was like you know what like it was a, sort of the difference in value between like learning about something versus like living it and 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 to me where that balance kind of lied which was really interesting experience for me. Um, okay, so with that, I feel like this has gone on a bit longer than I expected it to, but I will take a few quizzles from the uh, Twitch chat. 
Uh, Medium Messiah says, uh, in video games, you animated the mouth in one scene uh, way more than you uh, than normal. What's the story there? I never did it again. What's the story there? I just thought it was funny, dude. It was just like, <laughs> it was just like focused right in onto my face. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. And I think people are going to be really thrown off guard. So I thought that'd be really funny to do that. That was the only reason why. Uh, delusional. Uh, Delusion L says, have you spent much time trying to develop your voice? Uh, no, not at all. It's more like I just got better at speaking more naturally. Like I was honestly just for probably the first two years of making videos, just much more timid in front of a recording thing. And I also wrote the videos a bit poorly. Like I wrote them in ways where I would be forced to read them in a kind of awkward way. So I spent a bit of time like, okay, how can I write videos where I can say them in a bit more natural cadence? And that's really where I arrived, I think. So I think my more recent videos and the last couple that I showed on stream uh, were much more in line with how I'd actually speak. So that's my answer to that. Let me see, just very quickly. Um, uh, CG. AA, oh, thank you for the prime, the tier one, Confractus, thank you for the tier one, Steve Clymer, thank you for the tier one, and thank you everyone for the birthday wishes, Mess Express for that um, beautiful birthday serenade, and uh, all of you guys for contributing to that birthday video, that was very sweet. Okay, hang on, what's this one? Oh my god. <laughs> no. No. Okay, no. Okay, we're ending. I'm closing it. I'm closing it. I'm ending the stream. Ah, oh, fuck, dude. I'm so stupid, dude. I'm so fucking stupid. <laughs> okay. Okay, good night, you guys. Thank you for the birthday wishes. See you next week on Monday, just for some regular games, and then Tuesday for what makes it good, and then Wednesday for regular games, and then Thursday for the Valentine's Day special, unless I have a date, which I 